All right, so today we're going to continue on with Chapter 1. We finished off last week talking about mice and other pointing devices. And this week we're going to, or this week, today, we're going to continue on with cameras. All right, now, up here I have a lovely little camera. All right, what would you guys qualify this camera as? Give you a hint, the answer is on the screen. It is a digital camera. All right, that's not quite what I was going for, but it is digital. Anyone else have a one answer? All right, that would be your lovely old point and shoot. All right, this is what we all used to have before cell phones started having cameras in them. Is really what it comes down to. All right, um, I got my ooh, man. My first camera was three megapixels. Yeah, and now your phone has what like a forty megapixel camera on it. Like, I mean, again, the, the amount of pixels has just skyrocketed. But anyway, that is our standard point and shoot. We'll come back to that. But first, let's talk about focusing. If a camera is going to take a good image, you want it to be in focus. All right. Now, there are a few different options for how we're going to do that. All right. The first option is um, autofocusing. So the camera itself is going to look at your image, and it's going to compare pixel to pixel and go, we're in focus, we're not in focus. All right. This is... This is a good system. It's nice. You know, it make, keeps your life simple. You just press a button halfway down. The camera focuses on what it thinks you want to focus on because there's this whole picture and it's like, well, what's the important aspect? And it's going to try to get that in focus for you as best as it can. Sometimes it can. Sometimes you're too close that it can't focus on it. It really just depends on, you know, the image that you're taking. All right. And what this is doing is it's varying the focal length. So that's the distance at which the subject in front of the lens are in sharp focus. All right, so again, we got a nice, clear, focused image. Um, if you don't have a camera that has a variable focus, you're going to have a camera that is fixed focus. All right, and what, how, we, how that is successful. So traditionally, your camera um, has an aperture. Can I draw? I don't have aperture in here. I do, it's barely there. Um, but it allows you to have a range of focus. The smaller your aperture is, the smaller the hole, the larger the distance that things are in focus. The bigger the hole, the more light that gets into the sensor, so the quicker you can take your picture, but the, the smaller the area is in focus. If you ever see a picture where you have like a person standing, it's not, not on people's cell phones, all right? That's a whole different game. But if you see this picture some, that someone took with their nice camera, and the person is in focus and the background is all blurry, all right? That's because they had a very wide open aperture, which just kept a very small area in focus. Which is great, because it's a nice artistic effect let the background be naturally blurred. The reason I said not on cell phones is because your cell phones now have post-processing built into them. So you can be like, yeah, I want the background blurry, and you hit a button, and it takes a picture with everything in focus, and then goes, there's the person, and we blur everything else digitally. All right. But um, So the aperture is allowing us to have set how big of an area we are in focus. This is important because there are devices out there that are fixed focus, like your cell phone camera. All right, your cell phone camera may or may not actually focus. It really depends on the quality of the camera, cell phone camera. Um, but other things that have fixed focus, GoPros. You ever notice they never focus. Everything, basically from you know three inches or four inches, whatever the minimum distance on the camera is, to infinity is in focus. And that's because it has an extremely small aperture hole. So it allows a very large range of things to be look in focus. They aren't all truly in focus. They're all going to be a little blurry. And then as you get to the actual optimum focus point, it's going to be really sharp. And then as you get a little farther away, again, it's going to continue getting a little blurry and blurrier. But that is the benefit of that fixed focus. Webcams. Many webcams are also fixed focus, um, especially like on your laptops and things. It doesn't matter where you go in that image. Everything is in focus. And, and again, I'm going to put focus in air quotes here because... Not truly, truly in focus, but mostly in focus. Um, so, yeah. Um, and that takes us to the wonderful world of zooming. All right. Now, yeah. digital cameras. This is, to me, one place that digital cameras still beat out your cell phone camera. Capability to zoom. All right. Um, cell phone cameras are starting to play trickery with zooming because they're like, yeah, we, we can't. We can't fit an actual adjustable lens. That's that's too big. We can't fit that in our in our phone. What we can do is we can put more camera lens, more physical cameras with different lenses on it to allow you to get different zoom points. So you have the ultra wide angle that captures everything. Then you have the one that's the portrait that's really close. And then you have the telephoto zoom lens. So it has a zoom lens, but it's not adjustable. It's like you get these these stops basically. You have everything 
a little bit or, you know, really far away. And it's kind of nice that they did that. Price went up because we now have all these extra sensors with all these extra lenses. So a little give and take going on. Um, but zooming is still, to me, one of the big things that makes a nice actual camera better than your smartphone. You can actually have what's an analog or an optical zoom. And that is the lens actually moving. So we're actually taking lenses inside that and moving them closer or farther apart to get that zoom. Now, I always found it amusing if you ever had like a handheld camcorder, like a 125x zoom, and that is actually lenses moving, 125x. Any of you guys have used a handheld camcorder or any camera, and you're zoomed in that much, the littlest movement on your hand causes the whole picture to go all crazy because at 125 times, you know, you're so far away from you that, you know, a 16th of an inch movement here is like four or five inches all the way out there. So the whole camera, you know, it's really hard to keep anything in focus and whatnot. That, so. But anyway, if you don't have optical zoom, you have digital zoom. And that is how most cell phones are zooming nowadays. All right. Um, and this is all this is doing is taking your image and cropping it down and, you know, blowing up those pixels to be a little bit bigger. Which is great. It's like, okay, it allows me to zoom in on a picture. But it's no different than you just taking your fingers and, you know, pinching out once you've taken that picture. There is zero difference. So whether you take a picture, like, you know, of this room right as you guys sit, or I digitally zoom beforehand and take the picture, the only difference is it's pre-cropping the image when I save it. So you're really actually better off taking a picture of the whole room and then after the fact, zooming in on what you want. A little, little, little trick there for you guys. Um, and that'll also allow you to frame the image maybe a little bit better. This is also why um, videographers like to shoot in higher resolution than what they're actually going to output their final content. So if you actually are, like, if you own people on YouTube, they're like, oh, they're shooting in 4K. It's like, why? They're only outputting 10 p 1080 video. Well, that allows them to crop the image and get, you know, after the fact. So as long as they've got, okay, I've got you roughly centered, I can now crop you to the, be the left, I can crop you to be the right, I can do all sorts of fancy video editing tricks, not lose any resolution, but still get the shots I need without having to worry as much as when I'm taking them. So having a higher resolution is definitely a better option in the long run. Um, this leads us to the image sensor. And all an image sensor is really is a light detecting microchip. So it's this little itty bitty chip that sits on your motherboard of your phone or in the camera or whatever. And it's light detection. And it is traditionally, it is a light detecting chip with filters on top. So depending on which color filter is over that sensor is which color it's going to be detecting. So we have R, G, and B, red, green, and blue. Um, and there are different patterns for these pixels, depending on how they are. So it's like, yeah, it's super high resolution, but you know, only what, each pixel is only one color. So it, it does reduce your resolution down a little bit. But it allows you to capture that image and you know, put it on the screen. So if you ever take an image and you just like keep zooming in, in theory, if you measure like a raw image off a camera sensor, you would see a red dot next to a blue dot next to a green dot next to a red dot like blue, green, and it, you could actually zoom in. And there's some comedian out there who's doing a little skit on uh, Excel. And he talks about, you know, how every Excel cell is just a, just a number. It's all it is. And he keeps going on. He's like, and then if we apply conditional formatting to this, and now he turns each cell into a color based on the value. And then he just starts zooming out and out and out in his Excel file. And by the time he zooms all the way out, it's a picture of himself. <laughs> but just kind of interesting. It's just like, yeah, like each, each little pixel, all this is a number. It's a value between 0 and 1,024 or 2,048, depending on, you know, what magical bit analog that sensor is. Um, but just kind of kind of interesting to look at your image sensor that way. Um, the larger your image sensor, you might hear something called like a micro four thirds or a full size or, you know, all those fun things. Again, in your cell phone, you're going to have an itty bitty image sensor. Little, little chip. Doesn't do, you know, it, it does what its job. It collects all that data. However, the larger that chip with the same size pixels on it. So if you still, if I have a 4K chip that's one inch, you know, square, and I have a 4K chip that's a quarter inch square, because the quarter inch one fits in your phone, where the one inch one fits in the high end DSLR, the high end DSLR is going to be able to take much better pictures because of that image sensor being so much bigger is going to be able to absorb more light, which means you'll be able to take faster pictures or better low light, you know. So, a lot of games going to be played here. So, the size of that sensor does actually matter. It's not just pixels. Oh, it's like I have a 40 megapixel camera. Good for you. It can't take crap pictures because the sensor is so small. Like, okay, I've got a 24 megapixel image. Okay, now we're talking. Now the size-wise, better off. Kind of like the same thing with computer monitors. If you ever, you know, if you're watching YouTube, it's like, why is this so, like, blurry and fuzzy and what's going on here? It's like, well, 
your internet speed's slow, so you're only watching it at 360p instead of the 1080 that it's actually filmed at. So once you force it to go to 1080, everything crisps up real nice. Same kind of idea. All right, so as I said, up on the screen, point and shoot camera. Nothing super fancy about it. Our lens on the front, when you turn it on, extends out. So you know, when, it, when you're not using it, it retracts to protect itself. So when you shove it in your pocket, you don't break the lens off. Um, that allows them not to have the camera be as thick. Um, it's going to have some sh shutter lag. So from the time you hit that button to take the picture, from the time it actually takes it, there's going to be a little bit of time. I don't know about you guys. I hate that on my cell phone where I'm like, hey, take a picture of my kids. I click the screen. It's like, all right, there we go. Click it. It's like, they're not doing what they were doing now anymore. All right, and it's because the camera's like, oh, wait, I need to focus, or I need to do this, or I need to do that. So it just takes time. All right. Um, so that is one of the downsides to our standard cheapo point and shoot cameras is that going to be that shutter lag. Um, you can have some advanced, you can have an advanced point and shoot. All right. So you can have like your really cheap, like probably like what, $50, $100 you know, camera. Or you can step it up to be a $200 camera, and you might get some better features, like um, better zooming, different macro functions. You might have a dedicated little viewfinder screen. You know, you guys all take try to take pictures outside with your phone, and it's sunny, and you can't see the screen light you're taking real well. That's where that lovely viewfinder comes in, that many cameras are getting rid of. They're like, you don't need a viewfinder. You got this little three-inch screen to take a picture on. It's like, doesn't doesn't do as well as me being able to like, see everything. So viewfinders have kind of started going away. Um, you also might start getting image stabilization where they're actually using small actuators on the, the lens. So as you're trying to take that picture, if you're taking it at a slower speed, it's actually moving the lenses as your camera moves with your hands because your hands aren't perfectly still to make it take a better image. Kind of crazy. Same thing goes for uh, taking video. You don't see as much shaking going on. It's a much smoother uh, video. Um, and they also might have burst mode where you can just push the button down and have taken multiple pictures in a row. All right. Um, uh, I love that mode with kids because it's just like, all right, they're doing something funny right now. You just click the button, you hold it down for you know three seconds or whatever. It takes 10, 15, 20 pictures. If you're on like a, a cell phone, once it's it's focused right, it could take like 80 to 100 pictures in that three seconds. Um, I find it really interesting on, I know Apple iPhones do it and newer some Android phones do it. When you take a picture in the right conditions, it actually takes like a one second clip. And then you can like scroll back and forth and you're like, no, I like this one better. So you can actually go back and select it, which I just... It's so convenient when it's like, again, you're trying to get that perfect picture of your kids or whatever, you know, crazy thing of someone letting go of a rope swing at the exact right time and you're trying to get them flying through the air. Having that a capability of like scrub to the picture you actually want. Really nice. So um, but that'd be your, your burst mode right there. Next, you have your smartphone camera. All right. Um, this is going to be bad for low light situations. As I already talked about, the sensor on your smartphone is extremely small because, well, smartphones are small. I don't know about you guys. I wish my smartphone was like maybe 25 to 50% thicker and I had that much more battery life. <laughs> like, I don't need my cell phone to be this skinny and have crappy battery life. I'm like, you could even double it and I'd be okay as long as you like doubled or tripled the battery life on my phone. Like go from one day of use to like three or four days I would be freaking thrilled, but they're not going to do it because everybody wants skinny phones, just like everyone wants glass screens. I don't know about you guys. I want my plastic screen back on my phone. That way I can't break the damn thing. Can't tell you how many screens I've broken on phones. All right, anyway, um, smartphones, bad for the lights. Um, they also are bad for images with high dynamic range. And what I mean by high dynamic range is if you're ever sitting inside your house, looking out the window on a bright sunny day, your eye can see all the detail of what's happening inside that room, as well as the detail of what's happening outside. If you try to take a picture of that with your phone, it's going to either be all the detail inside and just bright white outside, or all the detail out outside and very dark inside. All right, so they're not great for those HDR, that's high dynamic range. Now, there are special modes, and what your phone does if you do have an HDR capability is it actually takes three, four, five pictures, again, like very quick in succession, and then merges them all together. So it takes the highlights from outside from the one picture, the low, the low lights from the inside from one picture, and it merges them all together to actually make a what's called an HDR photo, so that way you can actually see all of the different data going on. So, yeah, and your phone itself is really bad at taking one picture for that purpose, but because your phone has all this processing built into it, it's good for doing things like that where they can combine multiple. 
Um, as I've said, they're already good for, um, or they're already starting to have multiple sensors. I guess I've seen a cell phones with minimum of three cameras on them already. So this is kind of starting to get crazy in my book. Um, but they are good for that computational. So I said, creating that HDR, um, photogrammetry, so you can take like multiple pictures of a very big landscape that your lens isn't wide enough to capture, and then it will combine them all together. All right. Um, I know Android phones had the Google, like the sphere view, where you could take a picture here and then here and then here, and you could go like all the way around yourself. So you could actually spin around in 3D space in that exact spot and see everything around you, which was kind of neat. Um, you've got the you know the landscape view where you just take your phone and it'll hit it, and you just kind of slowly drag left and right, and it'll take you know keep taking pictures of the environment. So there's a lot going on there. So having all that computational power built into your phone is a really big benefit for a camera for you for that instantaneous gratification is what we all want, right? It's like, I want this picture, I want to take it, I want to post it to my Instagram, not me, I don't do Instagram, but someone in here does, and they want to post it up there so that all their friends can see that they were in this amazing spot. All right, uh, yeah, I, I, I do have a very nice DSLR camera myself, and I do all my post-processing at home. <laughs> take my pictures, I'm happy with them, I take them home. I do use my phone when I don't feel like carrying the, the giant thing out. But Anyway, that takes us to DSLRs. So up there on the screen would be what your standard DSLR is. Um, there are a few big brands for DSLRs. They would be Canon, Nikon, and Sony, I think. Now, DSLR stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. All right. So how they actually work is there's a viewfinder up at the very top on the backhand side. And the lens actually goes to a mirror, which then reflects that image up to some other mirrors into the lens at the, the viewfinder. So you are physically seeing exactly what your lens sees, perfectly, all right? Because you're literally using mirrors to look down the lens. Um, and then so as you change zoom or focus or whatever, it is actually doing that, you know, you're seeing the perfect image that whatever your camera is going to take is going to be it. You might have, a, it might crop it a little bit on the edges or, you know, expand a little bit depending on the sensor, things like that. But for the most part, you are seeing exactly what is there, which is why professionals like these, because they know this is the image I'm taking. Now, it's not like on your digital phone where you're, or, your, or the point and shoots where you're like, press the button down halfway and then all of a sudden the image kind of goes darker or whatever because it's like, oh, we're going to do this. You know, it's estimating what the image is going to be. No, it's like, this is what it is. But if you don't have all the other settings right or in, in an auto mode, it's not going to take that exact same image. It's going to be darker or lighter or more things or less things will be in focus because of the of aperture, ISO, and shutter speed. So got to go a little give and take going on there. Now, the, to me, the biggest benefit is to DSLRs is, A, they're extremely fast to take pictures. Like, once you've got it focused, and even if it's not quite focused, when you push that button, it focuses rather quickly, which is really nice. Um, B, you've got interchangeable lenses. So that giant bazooka that's on the front of this thing, you can take off and put other ones on. Um, if you're ever if you're a big fan of sports and you see the people taking photographies at sporting events, their lenses are like two feet long, some of them, and they're on tripods because they're that stinking heavy. <laughs> All right, so that gets them an ex super zoom. They have like just crazy zoom with lots of light coming able to come in. There's lots of benefits to that. Um, so that way they can get those really high speed action shots and keep them in focus and everything else. Um, they also are expandable. So if you need more light, you know, it has a little built in flash. It's a little crappy flash, but you can put a separate flash on it. You could connect it to studio flashes around the room. So that way when you take a picture, you've got lights going from all different directions instead of just where you are or you can pick the direction from the flash. You could add a separate microphone on top of it, and plug it in, you know, all sorts of capabilities what it comes down to. So there's a lot of capability that we can add on to this. Um, it does have a quicker autofocus, so that's nice. Um, and then my notes do say it is a near, nearly zero shutter lag. And when you actually take a picture, I haven't talked about this, since that light is going down, hitting that, that um, mirror reflecting all the way back up to your, your, your viewfinder, when you say take a picture, that lens actually moves out of the way. It, and then it hits the sensor, and then the lens comes, that mirror comes back down. That's your shutter, basically. So it's this physical object moving out of the way and then back into the way. And to me, that's just crazy. It's like, oh, yeah, we're just going to physically move this little lens inside your camera. It's like, what? So a lot going on for the digital single lens reflex. Um, and so this is basically what all professional photographers are using. Now. These are starting to go away. People are saying they're too bulky, they're too heavy, what's the benefit of them? Especially when you're comparing them to be a mirrorless camera, which is right there. All right. Mirrorless cameras have 
almost all of the same capabilities of a DSLR, except for they don't have that mirror that swings in and out of the way. All right, everything is digital. So if you have a little viewfinder on this, it's actually using the, the sensor data to then show the viewfinder what it is. So it's a digital path there instead of a truly analog path. So, but you get this much smaller body. You still have the interchangeable lenses. You still have all those other capabilities but it's not quite as as good, all right? This is overall, as I said, replacing the DSLR. Um, I think some manu camera manufacturers are actually starting to stop producing the DSLRs because they, they're just seeing it as an old, antiquated technology. It used to be you needed a DSLR on an old point-and-shoot with an analog film because that would move out of the way so the film could get hit and then you could come back down. So kind of a little give and take going on here. But um, they are smaller, they're lighter, um, they have said they have most of the same capabilities. They might even use the exact same sensor and computers and everything else. They just have to add a digital viewfinder to it if you want. Some of them even have like the option. You don't have to have the viewfinder. You can plug it onto the top. You know, there's a little like docking station for it. So a little bit of give and take going on there. Next, we've got the wonderful world of webcams. We all have one of these. You're, oh, you probably all have them. If you have a laptop, most likely you have one built right into the top of it. Some laptops have built-in little privacy screens, so mine actually has a little flip, little switch I can flip to actually physically cover up the camera for security concerns. Some do not, all right? If you are a security-conscious person, you do want to be wary of that built-in webcam, all right? Um, I can't tell you how many people I have see that have tape covering their webcam because they're just like, no, even if someone hacks my computer, I don't want them seeing the video on my computer, which I can't blame them. I've seen enough, you know, NCISs and whatnot where they're hacking web computers and pulling the webcam footage up it's like okay it must it must happen it happens in movies and tv shows it must be true happen to your mom yep so it can happen your computer can get hacked they can access everything on your computer at that point including webcams microphones those types of things you do want to be kind of careful about that. Um, so anyway, but webcams. Um, these are going to provide visual input for online communications. These are traditionally pretty crappy cameras, all right, especially the built-in ones, all right. Um, I always find it amusing watching, um, like, laptop reviews where they're like, and this is the webcam, and they, like, start showing, like, they're recording themselves for the video on the webcam, and they're like, and this is the webcam on this computer right next to it. It's like. Oh, that's night and day. <laughs> All right. So, yes, you can have a built-in webcam. It will get the job done, but you don't really want to use it for a whole lot. It's not like, let's let's shoot a whole video on my laptop. Let me hold it like this and videotape everything. A, that'd be freaking, freaking hilarious to see somebody do. Um, but B, the quality is just not going to be there. You can get dedicated, which is what I have up there. This is a Logitech. Um, and you can get different resolutions. So that one's in 1080p. I've got no clue what's built in my laptop. You can get 4K sensors, those types of things. Um, as I said, they're traditionally pretty crappy quality. This is why if you ever actually watch like people, you know, streaming, playing games and whatnot on their computer and they have an image of themselves, they're traditionally not using a standard webcam. They're traditionally using something like a DSLR with an HDMI capture card. <laughs> so it's the HDMI image coming out their DSLR, which then goes into their computer. All right. Um, at home, when I really need a webcam, I, I actually have for on my like work computer when I was doing Zoom and everything. I actually use my DSLR, except for um, Canon came out with a plugin or like a firmware update, so you could just use the USB cable and plug it in. So it still gave me complete control of zoom and um, focus and everything, and you know I could blur my background just by tweaking my aperture settings. Um, but it was only I think 720p because it was USB 2.0, so it couldn't handle the high quality bandwidth. So, uh, but no audio on that. I was like, oh. I had to get a separate microphone set up. But anyway. Um, so that was what I just did. I'm like, I'm not going to go buy a camera. I was like, do I buy a power brick to have my camera run constantly, or do I buy a web camera? And I decided the power brick was the better functional point because it allowed me more options in the long run. Um, so there's that. Now, if you're going to do videography, most cameras will work. Most cameras will record. There are plenty of YouTubers out there who are just using their cell phone as their video camera for recording their, their YouTube stick. Uh, many people out there, many of them, they especially start that way. They're like, well, I've got a camera in my pocket. Let's just use this and record video. And it gets the job done. All right. 
Um, especially in the earlier days of your YouTube channel, it's less about the quality of the video and more about the quantity of what is in the video. What are you doing and how do you act and those types of things. So in that case, your pocket camera, your phone, cell phone, perfectly qualified. However, if you're truly going to get into this, or you're truly going to be a videographer, you're going to use at least a DSLR or mirrorless or something better. And there are dedicated video cameras. All right. As I said, we had that handheld cam video camcorder. As I said, had like 125 eggs soup. You've got those. You've got uh, things that look like DSLRs, but they're actually video cameras. It really just comes down to like, what do you like? What are you trying to do? Um, again, like a bunch of vloggers, they'll use the DSLRs that have the flip out screen. So that way they can have the screen off the side so they can actually see the video they're recording. Kind of like using the front facing camera on your phone, but it's much better quality camera. So again, a little give and take going on there. Um, the biggest thing you probably want to about, worry about with videography is audio. All right. Um, you want to minimize wo uh, noise and things like that. And I believe it's called a dead cat. Um, it's this fluffy thing that you put on top of your microphone to help reduce wind noise and things like that. So noise is going to be uh, one of the key facts there. Whew. All right, questions? Nope. You're all masters of cameras. I like it. Makes my life easy. Scanners. All right. In that top right-hand corner, I've got your, your default scanner. All right. Um, and that's going to be your like optical. This is going to convert documents or you know papers, whatever, into digital files. Uh, traditionally, we save these as PDFs. And I'll be you guys. I hate PDFs with a burning passion. It's like, oh, you want to edit it? You need special software. It's like there's no good free software out there that I have found to edit PDFs yet. Even Google doesn't seem to have like a PDF editor built into their their Google suite of stuff, which annoys me. Um, it's just the way the game works. So I hate PDFs. But anyway, um, all it is is taking a picture. That's all it is. I mean, if you ever watched your, op your optical scanner work, there's actually a long bar that's the width of your scanner that physically moves down your paper. All right? It's not like they just have a camera facing up and taking a picture. No, it's this, this bar. I don't know how wide it is, you know, 10 inches, 11 inches wide. And it physically moves down your paper, taking image after image after image. So it's only image taking an image of like a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch or, you know, whatever at a time. And it takes all those and then it stacks them up and it goes, okay, here's your image. And because you've put your paper on this, this flatbed scanner and closed the lid, it's not like your paper's moving during this. So it doesn't cause any problems. All right. Um, you also do have, um, so that'd be a bed scanner. You also have the ADF, the automatic document feeder, which is up on there. So you put your picture at the top and it, pulls it through and it pulls it over that little single edge scanner and then shoots it out. Nice thing about that is you can just put like a stack of documents there and hit scan. It just pulls one in after the next, after the next, which to me is very useful. All right. um, yeah, especially now I'm having kids and things like having a scanner at home, super useful. Um, so the downside of those bed scanners, which are traditionally, if you have a document feed, you have a bed scanner, um, you only can do one document at a time. Kind of annoying. Um, there are some of those like scanners that you can get now that are just like one inch thick, like this like tube and a paper slides through it. It's basically an automatic document feeder, but it doesn't have like the actual feeder. You just like hit scan and put your document in. So really small, compact, something you could keep around. Some of them are wireless or they'll save like right to USB. So you don't even have to have them on the network or anything. You just pull them out when you need them. So really kind of use useful there. Uh, yep. So, um, as I was saying, if you're going to scan this, all this is going to be a picture. And if you want to actually edit it, you're going to have to use what's called OCR, or Optical Character Recognition. All right. Newer versions of Adobe have this built into it, so you can just be like, hey, here's, here's my .pdf. I need to work on it. It's like you click Edit Text, and then you, it scans the document for all the text, and it's like, oh, you want to put something here, or delete this, or that, or whatever? It gets the job done. It's not really great, because... It's not like giving it, sometimes it doesn't give you this whole paragraph of where all the text is. It's like each line is its own little separate line. So if you try to type more in than that fits, it doesn't, doesn't work well. And, you know, it's not nice free flowing, things like that. So again, I'm just not a big fan of PDFs, but that's going to be a, a, a issue with any scanned document is really what it comes down to. All right, next we have QR. Anyone actually know what QR stands for? You've all heard the term QR. How many of you actually scanned a QR code? Most of you. All right, that's good. All right. For those who do not know, QR is quick response code. All right. And it was designed to help make shopping interactive. All right. So basically, we all have smartphones in our pockets. 
connected to the internet or Wi-Fi or, you know, whatever it is. And the whole point of a QR code was so that you can pull your phone up and, you, you know, you go into your camera. I don't know if it's going to pick it up from this far away. Probably not. If I do this, it will. And once I put my phone over it, it will show me what that QR is telling me. And that QR code actually does tell you something. All right. It's just hagerstowncc.edu, nothing fancy, but it is actually a link. So, like, if you're like, hey, well, what is this? You can go up and scan it. Uh, um, I was watching, I was reading something that someone had a QR code in the background of every one of their videos when they were Zoom calling and things like that. And I don't know what it went, went to. I'm like, what is it linked to? I need to know. And no one would ever tell me. I never had a picture of the QR code. I just had, like, the news story about it. I was kind of annoyed. I was like, ah. But anyway. Um, so QR code, so it's meant to make shopping interactive. So it's like, hey, learn more about this. And you can go up and you can scan it and, you know, tells you all the information. Um, a lot of restaurants are slowly going to QR codes, especially when COVID hit and they didn't want to have the, the menus that could get, you know, infected and everyone else is passing around. No, they just said, here's a, you know, something on your table. Here's a QR code. You scan it. Our menu will pop up right on your phone. That way you just use your own device to scan through the menu and everything else. It also made updating their menu a lot easier because they could update it on a server somewhere and they wouldn't have to reprint everything or, you know, spend money on making nice, nice menus. They could just be like, yep, yeah, scan the QR code and you're good to go. Personally, I like the real menu. I like to be able to see the whole list of time, especially when it's like something at the top you're interested in and something at the bottom you're interested in. You don't have to scan, you know, move your screen between the two to read both descriptions and make your decision. Having a nice printed copy is nice, but... The QR code is very convenient if you like, kind of know what you want already. You just scan it and go, what's it called? You can find it and you're good to go. Um, this does stand, store a lot more information than your standard barcode. We'll go into barcodes in a minute. No, oh, we don't have barcodes on here. Oh, all right. You can have barcodes too. All right. Barcode, we've all seen them. Back of textbooks, basically any product has a QR code on it, or a, a, a barcode. Even my laptop, HTC, put a, a lovely barcode on the back of it. Um, for inventory purposes, they can just scan it and go, oh, inventory, we're done. All right. Um, but um, barcodes are traditionally just zeros and ones. So it's just like a UPC. It's, and normally it's whatever is written right by the barcode is what that barcode is telling you, which is kind of nice. Um, so barcodes are a lot easier to read, which is why you can see like a scanner in the store reading a barcode very nicely. Um, the QR code has a lot more information it can store. It can store your name. It can store your address. You can put your phone number, whatever you know, whatever you want. You could put a, a QR code on everything you own so that way when you lost something, hopefully someone could scan that QR code and go, oh, this belongs to Bob Murphy and his phone number is blah, 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 blah. <laughs> all right. On a side note, you all have lock screens on your cell phones, hopefully. You should put your email address on your lock screen so when you lose your phone, someone can email you and say, hey, I found your phone. Don't put your phone number. Kind of worthless to, if you lost your phone for them to call your phone. <laughs> so maybe put someone else's phone number, but, you know, I like my email address. That's what's on mine. All right, that takes us to the lovely world of RFID, or Radio Frequency Identification. All right, um, I have a lovely RFID tag right here, my keys, little blue one. All right, um, all of your college IDs are RFID, for those who didn't know. All right, um, so like I can take mine to certain doors on campus that have the, the readers, and it will actually say, yes, you're allowed to come in here and unlock the door for me, or no, you're not allowed to come in here, it's Sunday. I don't know why I'm not allowed to come on campus on Sunday, but like Monday through Saturday, there are m there are many doors that I can go to with my ID and open up if they're locked, which is kind of nice. Um, but anyway, so RFID is radio frequency identification. So we can read information without actually touching the object. That's the scary part of it, right? That's why they're like RFID blocking wallets and purses and like, you know, it's like, okay, your credit cards might have some sort of RFID in them, but someone can come up, scan your, your back for me in my back pocket, right? And get all my credit card information if I didn't have a RFID blocking wallet. Um, it's also kind of fun to see, is your wallet actually RFID blocking if it claims it is? <laughs> all right, um, which turns out mine is not as RFID blocking as I thought it was supposed to be. <laughs> we found that out like a week or two ago. It was kind of fun. Um, so this is traditionally with RFID, traditionally one direction. So you can read information, you're not traditionally writing information. All right. Now, there are special devices out there that can write information all right, to RFID tags, as long as the RFID tag is set up to be written to. All right. So this little blue one I have here is writable. So if you have the right device, you can say, hey, let me write some information to that. Um, that We were trying to copy something, and it didn't quite work. It kind of works, but not quite completely. All right. um, so a little bit of give and take going on there. 
And going along with RFID is NFC, which is that lovely symbol you see up on the screen with the radiating lines and the person with the hand with like a credit card in it. And that stands for near field communication. This one is supposed to be bi-directional, all right? Um, and you can, again, share data by touching devices or getting them close, all right? Um, where this is a lot right now is credit cards. You can walk up to, if your credit card has that little symbol on it and the store accepts it, you don't have to put your card in, you don't have to swipe it, you just tap it, wait for a beep, and you're done. Big fan. I like RFID, or NFIC, NFC, RFID for your credit cards. Really like it. I find it to be a lot quicker than the whole chip process of inserting it, and then you have to wait and get to like, oh, all right, it's done, now I have to pull it out, and the machine's beeping at me like it's mad at me because I didn't take it out yet. I always hate that. It's like that, that really like angry sounding beep with cr the credit card readers when you haven't taken your credit card back out. Yeah, it's like, couldn't they put a nicer beep in? And actually some of the people, some of the companies have started putting nicer beeps in. I don't know if anyone's noticed that. Um, but anyway, NFC, um, yeah, great. Some people's cell phones have NFC built into them. Um, and if you have like Apple Pay or Google Wallet, you can actually then use your phone to pay in certain stores. All right. Um, Martins accepts it nowadays, which is really nice. Most places that are starting to accept it. I really wish this would go universal because I've gone to Lowe's before and been like, damn it, I forgot my wallet. I had my phone. I'm like, can I pay with my phone? And they're like, no, we don't do that. I'm like, damn. <laughs> um, so went to the car, got the emergency cash fund out, and went and paid for whatever I could and had to you know, leave a few things behind. But that having that phone is so convenient. Some people's smartwatches, um, I know mine actually has it too, so I can actually pay with my watch, which is really kind of weird. The downside is you need to have an internet connection. So it's, it's, it is bi-directional. It's like, okay, I tap my phone here. That device sends my phone a code saying like, yes, okay, I'm actually doing this. And it talks to the, I don't know how it all works, but it's just kind of an interesting system in the long run. Um, we also have that magnetic strip reader. We all have seen those on credit cards and, you know, um, hotel room keys and those types of things. All right. Um, hold on, let's go back to RFID and FSC. Um, there are people out there that embed RFID and NFC chips into their skin, into their bodies. So instead of having to carry like their credit card, they can just put their hand on the reader and it scans it and it's good to go. Kind of creepy, but also kind of awesome. Like, could you imagine like, don't have to carry your phone, don't have to carry your wallet. It's just right here in your hand to go like pay for things. Little NFC chip. Um, Apple, if you have a, a Tesla, some of those are the RFID where they like, you can put your hand there and unlock your, your car. If you take the, the subway or, you know, public transportation often, you don't have to carry your, your car, you can just put your hand there. Sounds really convenient to me. Also really creepy. All right, so again, kind of a little bit of a give and take going on there. All right, back to magnetic strips. Um, so it's actually a magnetic strip. So there's actually pieces of, of information in ones and zeros on there in positive and negative polarities. This is why they say, don't take a magnet to your credit cards because you can wipe the data that is on that card. Fun side note there, yeah. Um, that's why if you ever hear like if you put your pocket in a if you put your like your card in your staticky pocket it could screw it up or something like that it's like yeah data can actually go corrupt on those cards on those magnetic strips i've never personally tested this because i've never had a card I, I need to get a reader and like when my credit card expires like take a powerful magnet to that and try to read it again and see what happens um but it's kind of interesting to see what information is actually stored on those barcode readers those magnetic strips um and like i think on my pennsylvania driver's licenses I think they store the information on there like four or five times. So it's not like it uses the whole strip to store the information. They have it on there multiple times. So when you swipe it, it's got multiple chances of actually grabbing the data. So kind of a fun little fight note there. And then we're moving on to the whole world, wonderful world of biometrics. All right. What do you think biometrics would inc include? Most of you are using a biometric lock on your phone. I'm guessing, but... Fingerprints. Who uses a fingerprint lock on their phone? Really? Okay, it's gonna like nobody but me. Am I the only person here? Oh, I love it, man. It's so quick. You just lock your phone with the fingerprint, and you're done. All right. I used to have my so if, with Android. If you're, my watch is close to my phone, I could leave it unlocked. And I used to do that, and then I got a fingerprint scanner. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> That's just as quick as me pressing the power button to turn it on. The fingerprint scanner will work. So I don't even don't even go there anymore. Um, but anyway, biometric is using measuring human characteristics. So things that in theory only you have. Now, fingerprints, obviously, every time you touch something, it could leave a fingerprint behind, especially if your hands are greasy or grimy and those types of things. So that is uh, one problem. Um, then you move on to things like eye retinas, so your eyes. Like, if you ever see, like, you know, the retinal scanner in the movies, those are actual devices out there. Um, in theory, like, face ID is even going to be. So if anyone uses their face to unlock their phone, 
few people are, yeah, all right. So that's also a form of biometrics, all right. Um, I'm always curious, like, how much, you know, Apple's like, oh, it scans a face. It has to be a real face. I'm like, okay, let's try a picture. <laughs> going to work? Is it not? Uh, you know, one of, those, one of those crazy things. Um, but yeah, so those are all different types of biometrics. Other input devices, we've got microphones, game controllers. Um, yeah, microphones, I think we all know what those are for. Game controllers, you have your traditional ones, which I have up in the top corner there. Um, I think we've got the Nintendo one, PlayStation, Xbox, and I don't know what the top right one is. It looks like an old PlayStation, but I don't actually know. Uh, and then you also have other ones that you might not think of, like flight controls. Like if you're into a big flight sim person, you might have a yoke and pedals and, and you know throttles and things like that that you would use for your flight control. So there are other types of game controls, like steering wheels. Tennis rackets, we're back from the Wii, Wii world, where you're you know, moving the thing back and forth, you have the tennis racket attachment, that's a game controller. Son of a biscuit. All right, anyway, back to the, the wonderful world. So, um, you could have do musical instruments as game controllers. Anyone big rock band fan out there? That was from ages ago. You had the drumsticks and the guitar, yeah. yeah. So, there are a lot of different options of game controllers out there. Um, and the whole point here is to try to make gameplay more realistic. And especially compounding that with like um, virtual reality, it's really starting to kind of be interesting because you know you could have you know you could have a tennis racket in, in the virtual reality world that you're you're tracking, and you could have one in your actual hand, so it you know the resistance and everything is there, not just having a game controller. So you do get into adaptive devices like the Braille writing devices, where they actually have like a like a screen where you can feel bumps and things that change depending on what's going on. You can do eye-driven keyboards, um, on-screen, head wands, mouth sticks, so all different ways to control things. All right. Another adaptive one, arguably adaptive, would be a mouse. Anyone see the vertical mouse? So instead of having your hand like flat on the table or over your mouse, your, your hand's actually sideways. Supposedly, that's a lot healthier for you. It's not as it's not going to cause as much like carpal tunnel and things like that. Again, one of those things I'm like, I'd be interested to try it for like a few days, but I don't want to go spend the fifty dollars or hundred dollars on one of these fancy mice just to try it for a few days to see if I like it better. And also, a lot of times those mice are like, you're trying to like two buttons with a scroll wheel type of thing. There's not like extra buttons and things like that. So, um, And voice recognition. How many of you guys use OK Google or Siri or Alexa? All right, many of you guys shaking your head yes. I told you guys that my dad just, anytime he needs to send a text message, hits the microphone button because he doesn't want to try to type on the phone. He'd just rather dictate it to it. So voice recognition is wonderful monitors all right so when it comes to your monitor you're used to hearing about the resolution it's like you know it's 1440p or 1080p or 4k or whatever all right and especially when it comes to like the world of laptops the resolutions aren't being as standard anymore all right if i tell you it's 1080p you know that's a 16 by 9 ratio so it's 16 units wide for every nine units tall all right laptops are starting to get like four by three ratios and things like that they're they're starting to like stretch things a little taller to make it easier to read a Word document, you know. 16 by 9 is great for like watching movies because that's what they film them in. Film, I'm going to put that in quotes because like you go to a movie theater, they're normally like even skinnier and wider than that. But, you know, it's like great, we can watch all this. But when you're actually like doing productive work, the resolution, you want more real estate for certain applications, all right. Uh, which is why I've talked about having multiple screens. So you can do like Word on one screen and this on another. Um, at my house, I've got three monitors. Two of them are 90 degrees. So there were four by three. There were four wide by three tall. So now they're three wide, four tall. And it's great to put a Word document on there. It's like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Like you could see the entire document at once if you actually wanted to. So for that aspect, it's great. Um, so we do have that. And, and the, what, when I say 1920 by 1080 resolution, that's talking about the pixels. So it's 1,920 pixels wide by 1,080 pixels tall. Um, so, and it comes down to resolution. Now, the higher your resolution, if you go from 1080 to 4, 4K, that's 4,000 pixels tall. Well, that's not four times as big from 1080. It's 16 times as big because it's also four times as wide. So the amount of processing power you need to process that skyrockets right there with that resolution. So we want to have more resolution because it makes you better, more detailed and things like that. But at the same point, the higher the resolution, the more processing power you need. Um, People on, some people you know, on the internet say that 1440p is the ideal gaming resolution because it's high enough that you get a lot of detail, but it's low enough that you don't need stupid high-end graphics um, GPUs to be able to do it. So there's going to be a lot of give and take going on there. Um, LCD and LED, um, the only real difference there is the backlight. 
The LCD stands for liquid crystal display. That's what's on probably mo all the computers in here. Maybe your laptops will have something different, but the ones that are actually in here are LCD. Um, LED, if you hear, oh, it's an LED, whatever, that's just the backlight. Our LCDs have fluorescent tubes. All right, that's how they actually used to, you know, backlight them. They'd be very small. Even laptops would have small fluorescent tubes in them. Nowadays, we're going to LED. So they're light emitting diodes. They are lower power draw, which is the big benefit. They're lighter, they're smaller. So there's a lot of good benefits going on there. If we move to the world of OLED, the O stands for organic. So it's organic light emitting diodes. Um, so in this case, instead of having one giant backlight along the back of your screen, every pixel has its own backlight because it's organic. So it gives you much blacker blacks. Because on a traditional, you know, if, you, if we were to put all of you, if you put up a black screen on your laptop screen and you turn the lights off, you see that glow from around the edge. That's that backlight. It's still on. It's trying to, trying to light up your screen, but you're saying it's black, so it's not letting any light through. But the OLED, since it's a black screen, it's not actually outputting anything. It's just off. All right, which also gives you power savings on portable devices because you're not backlighting all those pixels that aren't being used at that point in time. This is also why dark mode is a good thing for cell phones. If you have an AMOLED or OLED screen, it's actually allowing you to turn off those pixels so it's not producing as much, using as much energy to light the screen. So something to think about with dark mode. Um, then that leads, that leads us to AMOLED, which is an active matrix of OLED. Um, this is going to be sharper and have a wider viewing angle than a traditional OCD would have. And then we have um, projectors. All right. You've got two types. You have DLP and LCD. So DLP is digital light processing. The projector uses tiny swiveling mirrors to create the image. So it's actually like shooting little lasers at the screen and then moving the, the, the mirrors to actually move that laser around on the screen. Kind of crazy. All right, not exactly like that, but that little mirror is moving to actually change things. Where an LCD is literally taking one of these LCD panels which I have done. This was a project I did back in my undergrad. Um, I called it Projected the Cheap Way. I bought one of those old school projectors that you, many of you might not have ever seen. That you just put a transparency on and it puts it up on the screen for teachers before like projectors were actually a thing. And I took a computer monitor apart and I put the monitor on top of it that way. So it was just the LCD. So it was you know, this bright light source underneath this thing projecting up on the wall. So I created my own little projector. It was a very fun project in the long run. Um, but yeah. So that was kind of an interesting one. But anyway, LCD is just that. It's just a very bright light source behind this LCD panel. And it's allowing light or blocking light based on those pixels. So just like how your screens in front of you work, but with much higher power lights and mirrors and lenses to focus and send the, the image farther away. Now, to power these things, we're going to need GPUs. All right, GPUs are graphical processing units. And at the bottom of the screen, I have probably the best image you're going to see for this. With a CPU with a built-in GPU, um, anything that you're going to do processing-wide is going to go through that CPU. So all of your processing tasks and all your, your graphical processing tasks are all going to go through that CPU. And you can see how it kind of gets bottlenecked there. All right. Where if we have a dedicated GPU, anything that's graphical-related, your CPU goes, I don't need that, send it over here. And it redirects it down your PCI lanes to your GPU. And then your GPU processes all that. So it allows your CPU to process more and your GPU to process more. So you're actually adding processing power to your capability, which is a really big benefit. This could, as I said, it's best when it's its own dedicated card. You'll have the best processing power for graphic purposes. For power purposes, dedicated cards aren't going to be the best. So a little bit of give and take going on here. Um, yes, GPUs can be used for mining. Those who are either into mining or not into mining, there are dedicated mining cards, but Anyway, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. Um, now, here are some examples of ports that you might see when it comes to um, videos. So bottom right is that blue VGA. Again, if you look at the monitors in front of you, you will see that VGA port down there on the side. All right? um, that is an old, that is actually analog based. So it is analog signals being sent. You can still do 1080p over a VGA port. I don't know if you can go much higher than that, but it's possible. Um, then we move to like DVI. Um, DVI is digital. It's tried to replace it. Notice we have a dual link DVI on the left and a single link DVI on the right. Um, and the big difference between DVI and HDMI is basically audio. HDMI is basically the, the, the display port or the DVI, um, but it doesn't have audio. HDMI has the capability to carry audio. That's why HDMI kind of kind of took over DVI. I don't know if any of you have noticed that. There's not a lot of DVI connectors around there anymore. 
um, especially on newer hardware. But uh, HDMI is like on everything, right? Your laptop has it, your TV, your DVD player, your game consoles, HDMI kind of kind of kicks some butt there. Next to HDMI, um, I should go back a second. You, we do have different versions of HDMI. So your TV has to support it, and the, the device you're plugging in has to support it, and your cable has to support it. But there is now, I believe, actually HDMI 2.1. I only have the Spectre 2.0 here, which is 18 gigabits per second, which allows for 60 frames per second at 4K. Um, or and, uh, and you also have the, the option of 10-bit or 12-bit color, depending on what you're trying to do. All right. Now, normally, the higher resolution color, those extra two bits, is going to affect your frame rate some. So, you know, it might only get 30 frames per second then at 4K instead of 60 if you're going to go to the 12-bit color. Um, so, for gaming, you might want the lower, the 10-bit, but the 60 frames per second. And then watching a movie, you might want the 12-bit and the 30 frames, which is kind of annoying, but it's the way the game works. Um, so, there is that. Next to HDMI up there on the left, I have DisplayPort and Mini DisplayPort. Mini DisplayPort is still a thing. Not as big a thing as it used to be. All right. This is a rather new laptop. I do have HDMI, but that's all I have output on this. Um, I also do have USB-C, which you could probably uh, probably get some video adapters for. Um, but Mini DisplayPort is still a, is still out there. And the nice thing is you can do Mini DisplayPort adapters to any of these things. You can do the DVI, you can do VGA, you can do uh, HDMI. You can just go to normal DV display port. So that mini is really a good one. Macs used to like default to the mini display port. Newer Macs don't have them anymore. So, um, and then we also do have the option of USB-C. Again, we were talking about this earlier, the, the Thunderbolt connection where you can do PCI, and video, and all sorts of wonderful things with, with the, with the USB-C port. So I've got no clue what USB-C ports I have on here, but possible it could work. All right. When it comes to audio output, we've got a few options. Now, I have these kind of in a bad order, but the sound card at the very bottom. If you want audio output, you need some sort of sound card. All right. Um, and the sound card is what provides the auto connections for both input and output devices. High-end cards can handle up to eight speakers. So you'll have up to eight different things plugged in. Traditionally, that's going to be a 7.1 format where you're going to have seven surround sound speakers, and that point one is your subwoofer. All right. So kind of a, an interesting way there. This can include an optical. It's a little like square port that is an optical. It's actually a digital audio connection. So it's sending all your audio data over this, like basically like a fiber optic line. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then you have different options. You've got speakers, headphones, noise canceling, and headsets. Speakers, we're all probably used to speakers. You know, you plug them in, come and built into the device, whatever the case is. Um, this is just converting digital sounds into analog. And they're all doing it. Whether it's speaker, headphones, noise canceling, or headsets, they're all going to convert digital sounds into analog. Um, Traditional speakers are going to be stereo. So you'll have two different speakers, and you have a left channel, a right channel, and they can be different. All right? And that's, again, supposed to be kind of an immersion thing, to make you feel like if you're sitting at a concert and the person's on the right side of the stage, that he comes out of the more of the right side speakers, so you know that he's to your right or to your left or whatever the case is. Um, as I said, that point 0.1, if you ever hear, like, if it's a 2.1 or 5.1 or whatever setup, that's just talking about the, the, us having a, a dedicated subwoofer, which I do suggest. If you're going to buy a pair of computer speakers, don't buy the cheapest ones you can get. Buy one with a little bit of a subwoofer to them, like top right picture on that screen. You probably won't regret that little decision. All right. Um, next, we have headphones. These are going to be personal size speakers, right? They go over your ears or in them. Doesn't really matter which way we're going. Um, and yeah, they can be really cheap or they can be stupidly expensive. All right. In my pocket, I think I still hear. Yep. I've got my Bluetooth headphones. I think these are like 20 bucks. For my purpose, they're great. All right. Back when COVID hit, this is how I did my, my Zoom meeting office hours. I'd just throw one in my ear. I'd walk all around campus. I'd be like, I gotta go talk to this person. I'd be in my office hours. But at least I was available whenever you guys would like sign in. My phone would beep at me and I'd pull my phone and I'd go, hey, how you doing? <laughs> but I was available. Um, but yeah, like a cheap pair of Bluetooth headphones, I am all in for it. Now, if you're a real autophile, you're going to hate my little cheap pair of headphones. <laughs> um, but most people, 20, 30 bucks for a pair of Bluetooth headphones, they're, they're absolutely wonderful until you lose one or lose the case. <laughs> That's the downside. Um, yep. Now, noise canceling. The whole point of this is to reduce the ambient noise. All right. And this is done technologically, not just by blocking it. Not just like going, we're going to put an earplug in your ear so you don't hear it. No, it's actually taking a microphone on the outside of your headphone, listening to the sound, inverting it, and then shooting it out the speaker. So by the time that noise would hit your ear normally, it's got the inverted sine wave and it will cancel each other out. So you're actually removing the sound that way. All right. Um, 
a little give and take on that. People that either love noise canceling or hate it. All right. Um, so it kind of each their own. And then I have headsets up there. And the reason I have headsets there is because it includes a microphone, according to your book. Like, that's the big difference between a headset and, and, and headphones, is a microphone. Which I guess means my Bluetooth speakers are headsets, not headphones. Yeah, really, really kind of funny. It makes me laugh that way. I think they're really more talking about gaming headsets, which are traditionally your over-the-ears ones that have, like, a microphone boom hanging off of them. I think that's what they want to say a headset is compared to headphones. But you can make your own decision on that one. Ooh, printers. All right. So with printing, you all are used to traditional paper printing, all right? And most likely, if you have a printer at home, you're rocking in an inkjet. And if I were you, I would throw that thing away. Actually, use the ink, then throw the thing away. All right. Inkjet printers are great. They are cheap. Sometimes when you buy a new computer, you get one for free. But the ink is stupidly expensive, and it doesn't last that long. Um, so that's why, personally, I would get rid of it. Um, if I was going to replace it with one, it would be the laser printer, which is like five or six down the list. Um, laser printers use a laser beam to create an image on a drum that is then transferred to the paper using toner. All right. um, the laser printers up front will cost you more money, but the toner can be stupidly cheap. All right. um, we bought, because the, the toner comes in different colors, so you have CMYK, cyan, magenta, uh, yellow, and then black. And you bought like five different, you know, five toners for like 50 bucks, I don't know, two or three, two years ago maybe at this point, maybe a year. And we still have, I think, a whole new black cartridge. <laughs> like, man, 50 bucks for like a whole year of printing, you know. And my wife prints like her textbooks off and she's taking classes if she has a digital one that she can print. So it's not like we're not printing with it, but it's, it's there. And it also doesn't dry up on you. Like, you know, it's like, oh, let me go print. The inkjet isn't printing. You're like, what happened? Oh, the ink dried up. Can't use it anymore. So I do highly suggest going with the whole wonderful world of laser. Now, as we start getting into more fancy printers, you're going to get into like the dye sublimation. And these printers use heat to transfer a solid dye into a gas that is then transferred to specialized paper. Um, the other benefit of the dye sublimation is you can print on like anything. <laughs> All right, so like you could put your t-shirt in to, this, to a dye sublimation printer and print onto that or a coaster or your laptop. You're like, I want to put a fun logo on this. I don't want to get it, put a sticker. I want to print on it. Well, you put your whole laptop in this thing and it would transfer it to there. So in that case, it, the isolation is pretty freaking awesome. You have thermal papers, which use heat. All right, um, Many of you probably know this, but um, receipts that you get from stores are actually thermal printers. There is no ink in that printer. It's The paper itself is heat sensitive, and it, will, when the, it has a little head that goes back and forth, which is why you never see them replace ink in those printers. They just replace the roll of paper when the paper runs out. Um, I, it's... Not necessarily going to be a cost savings for them, but it is definitely one less thing that they have to worry about going wrong in the printer itself. Um, that's why if you ever take like a, if you take a lighter to the back of your receipt from a far enough distance, you will erase it. It'll just go all black, so you actually won't be able to see it. It's also why if you have a really old receipt, you don't see anything on it anymore. It's like, or it's very faint. It's because the heat, the transfer has kind of gone away. Um, you have all-in-one printers, which are going to have a scanner built into them. Sometimes they'll also have copy machines or fax machines. All right. Um, yeah. And then up on the screen, I've got my wonderful 3D printer. All right. These are still in their infancy, I'm going to call it. All right. 3D printers are freaking awesome. All right. Now it's like, oh, I need this. And instead of you going to a store to buy it, if you're lucky, you can go to the internet, download it, print it, and you have it in maybe an hour or two instead of having to go to, you know, drive somewhere and get it, which might only take you 10 minutes, but, you know, you had to go pay for the thing. You just had to hit go on this. All right. And they're great for fixing and repairing things if you're good enough with CAD. However, there are lots of problems with them. You're literally laying plastic down. Basically, one it's like a glorified hot glue gun. Imagine taking a hot glue gun and trying to draw an object with it. And letting it cool, and then moving up, and then drawing on top of that object. And then drawing on top of that object again. And that's how you build up the layers. And each layer on a printer like this is like 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters thick. So if you have a 1 inch tall object that's 25 millimeters, that's 250 layers. <laughs> That, that printer has to print to make that. So there's a lot that can go wrong there. Temperature issues, filament issues, adhesion issues, there's a whole list. Yes, so this would be a, a filament or a fused deposition modeling, and there is resin as well. Um, the resins have their own issues, uh, and the biggest one with resin is, resin is it's actually curing the liquid using UV light traditionally. All right, so that means if you leave your, your bottle of resin around, 
it can cure by itself because unless you like keep it in a black cabinet all the time and you know blackout box so the bottles should be overall light resistant but it's not going to be perfect nothing is going to be perfect so your resin will slowly solidify over time and go bad filament will absorb moisture and go bad so a little bit of give and take there's no perfect system here when it comes to this um, the best 3d printer is the one that you keep using <laughs> because then you keep going through your supplies and keeping them fresh so a little give and take going on that but to me, 3D printers are awesome. I have one at home. We've got a bunch on campus for, for building stuff and mechanical engineering students to design and print things and stuff like that. So good fun there. Communication devices. Your big question is analog versus digital. All right. Analog is going to be continuously variable. So if I ask you the temperature in this room, you tell me it's 69 or 72 or whatever the magic number is. If you look in the wall up there, it will tell us. Um, where digital, it's going to tell you 01010001110001. It's going to store that same number, but in binary. All right. That's the real difference there. Um, so when you're communicating, when you're on your home network, you're on your Wi-Fi or whatever, you're using digital. If you have Antietam and you're using your cable modem, that is analog. So you go from a digital network at your house to your modem, which converts it to analog, which sends it out to Antietam, wherever their servers are, which then converts it back to digital and probably sends it over fiber at that point. Now, if you're using point broadband because they just got installed and they're running fiber optics, then you're going digital basically the whole way, at least until it goes to an analog section. So, a little give and take going on there. Um, you will need some sort of network interface card. You're going to need a NIC. All right. Um, this establishes a connection with a network, and it could be hardwired or wireless. So, Ethernet is going to be your hardwired option. I've already told you guys if you can go Ethernet, go Ethernet. All right. It will save you lots and lots of connection issues. Uh, if you have to go wireless, you have to go wireless. It's just the way the game works. Uh, wireless is going to have more latency than um, Ethernet. Ethernet, um, most older computers are going to be 100 megabit per second next. You get 100 meg per second. Um, newer computers are going to have gig. High-end computers are going to have 2.55 or 10 gig. <laughs> so it really just depends on the computer you're using and how fast you can transfer data. I will tell you, you all don't need more than a gigabit per second in your house for any reason, unless you're doing like video editing on one computer and all your data is on another one, or you're just transferring a lot of data across your network. But I, one gigabit will be plenty for all of you, for an average user. There's no need to go any higher. Wireless, um, it says it's going to have higher latency. There are two different, I'm going to call it versions. You have the wonderful world of 2.4 gigahertz, and then you have 5 gigahertz. 2.4 is our older technology. It is still used today vastly. All right. Um, five gigahertz is the newer one. Um, you can see some different standards up on the screen. If we look at the, the highest ones, 802.11n at 2.4 only goes up to 300 megabytes theoretical, 150 in the real world, where 811 n on the five gigahertz is 900 theoretical, 450 real world. So going to five gigahertz allows you to have a lot more transfer speed. The downside to the higher frequencies at five gigahertz is it doesn't penetrate through walls and things as well. All right. Which is why, if you guys ever look, look on your ceilings all, all over campus, you'll see the wireless access points, which are up there on that little box. You basically will see one like in every classroom and in the hallways, you know, they're all over the place. So that way you have the best wireless signal possible. So you're not going through walls and we're not overloading one access point in two rooms over with five rooms worth of data type of thing. So that is why we're doing that. So the older technology is still used. It's gonna be a little bit slower. It'll still be just fine for streaming or whatever it is, as long as you've got a good connection. Um, 80 to 11G is going to be your minimum connection speed there. 10 megabits that you can get probably 1080p over that. Um, your modem, this is how we would connect to either, as I said, your um, TV. If you're going to go out over uh, Antietam, that'd be a cable modem. Or a normal modem is actually your old phone line. Any of you guys in here ever actually use your, 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 uh, an old school phone line to connect to the internet? Yep, okay, we're at that point where you guys didn't have to log into AOL and hear the wonderful <laughs> noises. That was always lovely. All right, and then faxing is converting paper to digital and setting it over the line. Up here, I just have lots of peripherals. We've already talked about most of these things, but I just wanted to leave this in. This is from my old PowerPoint. When it comes to data storage, I know I'm almost out of time. We've got a few options. For external storage, you do have hard drive-based external storage. All right, um, we'll come back and talk about hard, uh, hard drives in a minute. And then you have flash-based stuff, which is going to be like those compact flash cards I have on the screen, um, USB drives, those types of things. So. Um, Flash is going to be your better option typically anymore. Flash is going to be faster. But it, good flash is faster, not necessarily a little SD card. Um, if you actually see the class on an SD card, like class 8 or class 10, that is dealing with its read-write speeds. So 
that's why if you're like you're like oh i got about a gopro and i can't record on it it's like well your sd card might not have a high enough class to be able to read the data or write the read have the data written to it quick enough so um, with the hard drive base the external you're either going to use eSATA, which is basically dead usb which is overall used firewire again basically dead and thunderbolt that is also still being used oh and other data you have is cds and dvds and blu-rays so for internal storage, you're going to have hard drives. And you have basically three options. You have a traditional hard drive. That's the one on the left. That's that big three and a half incher. You, there are, these were passed around last class, um, or maybe might have been passed around. Um, those are going to be your large, your large hard drives. They're your high data storage. Um, I have ones at home that are four terabytes. You can get eight, 16, 32. Like, but the size of those just kind of skyrockets. Next to that, to the right, we have what's a, called a two and a half inch drive. You can get mechanical spinning drives of those. All right. And again, those large sizes, but those are more traditionally used for laptops. And then, um, but most of the time now, the two and a half drive is called an SSD. It's a solid state device. This is completely flash based. It is less power hungry, quieter, and cooler than a traditional hard drive. So basically for anything portal and battery operated, SSDs are a huge win. You can get them again in like large file formats or large capacities. And now the newest, newest man on the block is the M.2. That's that one on the far right. Your M.2s, it's just the form factor. It's that size. There are different versions. There is an MVME, NVME, so I have it, and that's non-volatile memory express, which uses PCI lanes, so you get much higher transfer seeds compared to that of SATA. All right, so a little bit of give and take going on there. Just from some wonderful notes here, if you have a 7,200 7, RPM hard drive, traditional spinning rust, as some people like to call it, because it's, it's actual metal spinning in there, um, you get a read-write spin between 80 and 160 megabits per second. With SATA 3, you can get up to 550, so, you know, we just tripled. And then if you go to NVMe, you can get up to 3,500. <laughs> so we just went up sevenfold. This is why the NVMe is the king of the high-speed access, is what it comes down to. And again, you guys, the, the traditional hard drive, you will notice the difference between that and an SSD. But a SATA to an NVMe, the average person really won't see those speed differences. Because while technically, yes, it can go that fast, your, your processor and other things like that will be your limiting at that point. So it's not going to be able to go quite as fast. So a little bit of give and take going on there. Um, when it comes to power supplies, which I don't think are actually in the book, which bothered me, um, you have different ratings. And it's, you can see if they're if 80 plus bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and titanium. All right. Um, so it's going to be really important to pick um, the higher, the, you know, the, down the line, the more efficient they are at under load. So you can see the titanium is 90% efficient at 10%. None of them are other ones tell you what proficiency they are. When you get the 50% load, I believe that's where the rating is really true. So titanium is 94, but just 80 plus is only 80% efficient. So you're losing 14% of electricity just out the window between those two. So having a higher level, especially if your computer is going to be on constantly, is going to be good. And you also want to make sure you size your load based on your processor. Um, there's a wonderful website called PC Parts Picker, which will like help you build a computer and tell you how big of a, a power supply you actually need, which is nice. Um, and lastly, we have with power supplies for your desktops, modular, semi-modular, and non-modular. All right. Um, is there any real difference between them? No. All right. The biggest difference is, can I disconnect the cables I don't want? So a non-modular has all the cables attached permanently. You put it in your case. You have to hide all the extra ones you're not using. A modular, you have a semi-modular, you have the 24 pin, which every computer is going to use on their, their motherboard, but the rest can be plugged and unplugged as you need. And then a modular allows you to move that 24 pin as well. That's really the only difference between the three. So. All right, I have talked enough, and that's the end of chapter, I don't even know what chapter we're on, three, two, 